on the whole, agricultural goods, farm products, had never been transported over large distances to feed populations far away. The, most, the only interesting precedent I could think of, and I was discussing before with uh, Jackie, is sugar and Sidney Mintz's wonderful book on sweetness and power. But sugar from the Caribbean, from the New World, that was going to the Netherlands, going to Britain and helping their manufacturing industries develop, was still initially primarily a luxury food, although it then later became a staple. It was not a carbohydrate staple like wheat that was exported from North America. And the most wonderful book, which I brought this home to me, is a book by William Cronin, a great uh, American environmental historian, which is called Nature's Metropolis. It's about Chicago. And it's not only about the development of the Midwest and the commodification of family farming and the wave of exports to world markets um, from the American Midwest. It's also about, for example, futures trading in farm products. It started in Chicago. So there was a whole lot of institutional innovations that accompanied this new kind of capitalist agriculture, which for me is represented more by what happened in Chicago, middle to late 19th century, than by what happened in the estates of Leicestershire or, or Normandy in the, uh, in the 16th century. If my great friend and comrade Terry Byers was here, he would be hissing and booing, but that's, that's my view. So then, the last historical chapter is on the current period, that of neoliberal globalization from, say, the 1970s. And I won't say much about that because I'm sure people are familiar with the broad outlines of what's happening happened in the world economy. Uh, since the 1970s, including the end of developmentalism, of state-led development throughout most of the South, uh, which was part of the liberal, uh, neoliberal agenda, to, to push the state out of economic management and so on. The last three chapters of the book are, again, somewhat more theoretical, um, but using these historical chapters and the kind of ideas and examples they put forward to develop further and more explicitly the kind of theoretical position um, that I'm, I'm suggesting. Now, chapter six is called Capitalist Agriculture and Non-Capitalist Farmers, Production, Exploitation and Resistance. And I really won't say too much about this except it relates to an old debate which continues today. Well, if capitalism is so powerful, so dominant, so widespread, why are there still all these small farmers, particularly in the South? Why, why are they still there? How, how do you explain that in what I would say is a fully capitalist world? So I look at three kinds of explanations of uh, trying to answer that question in, in, in this chapter. Um, there's so many Canadian connections here, <laughs> it's coming clear to me. One is called, um, the first type of explanation is capital's problem with nature. That capital likes to control things in factories. And the materials you work with in factories have already been appropriated from nature. You know, you, you, you have, you have cotton that's going to be spun into thread. When you grind cotton in the field, what happens if soil fertility is diminishing, you haven't got the best available seeds, you're farming cotton in, in rain-fed conditions and the rain doesn't fall or doesn't fall at the right time and there's not enough rain. In other words, 
appropriating nature directly by growing the field of cotton involves different risks, different considerations than if you're setting up a cotton factory in 19th century Manchester or, or, or wherever. And um, the Canadian connection is that there was a very interesting Marxist explanation of this put forward by graduate students, I think they were, at the University of Toronto in the 1970s, Susan Mann and James Dickinson. And um, their explanation was, well, if you read your Marx, there's a difference between labor time and production time. And in farming, production time much exceeds labor time. You know, in other words, you, have, you, you clear the field, you plant, you might weed later on, but you have to wait for the plants to mature or the animals to mature, at least they did in those days, instead of ingesting them full of chemicals and hormones like they do today. So you had to wait. So labor time, which is what capital makes its profit from, was shorter than production time. So capitalists had to wait until the full organic cycle of production was completed before they could sell the cotton or whatever it was in the field and, and make their profit. So that was a very interesting uh, explanation. What is the answer of capital, agribusiness capital, to this problem with nature? Well, as we know, it's to simplify, standardize, and speed up natural processes as much as possible, to control them, to bring them as close to the ideal of factory production as one can. So genetic engineering, genetic, um, genetic to, to engineer genetically modified organisms is of course the, supposedly the cutting edge of this here in today's um, agribusiness. A uh, second kind of explanation of why there's still all these peasants and family farmers under capitalism is that um, they can produce competitively. They pay themselves less than capitalists do. They don't have the same uh, need for a, a stock of profit. Um, Chayanov, great Russian agrarian economist, observed this when 70, 80 years ago in Russia. Yes, peasants will pay higher rents than capitalist farmers because they need to produce for their own reproduction, their own livelihood. Yes, they will sell their farm products at lower prices than capitalists because they need the money immediately to reproduce themselves. So, on one hand, you could say small or family farmers are competitive, but another way of saying that, the other side of the same coin, is that they are exploited by capitalists. So there are still many small farmers or family farmers because it's beneficial to capital in modern capitalism to have them there doing the hard work, taking the risks from which capital then derives its profits in other ways. And then finally, there's the question of resistance. And resistance is, you know, resistance is exciting. Resistance is the sexy one. Yeah, resistance. You know, that there are still all these small farmers and peasants because they resist capitalism. Well, it's more complicated than that. First thing I thought was interesting is that there are, res there are concepts of resistance at very different scales of political and social action. Classic book by Eric Wolf, great, great anthropologist, Peasant Wars of the 20th Century. He was saying modernity, the 20th century was shaped by these peasant wars, Russia, Mexico, China, um, and uh, Vietnam, which was the one that preoccupied him at the time he was writing, the American War in Vietnam. And then on the other hand, we have Jim Scott, who was here two years ago, who wrote a famous book called Weapons of the Weak, and part of his sociological anarchism that I mentioned earlier is that at an everyday level in villages everywhere, the small people, the small farmers and so on, the apparently powerless, are doing all kinds of things that actually improve their lives. They resist in hidden, surreptitious ways uh, the powers that surround them, 